Hello Future, today is October 25th, 2016 and we're broadcasting from Concordia Theological Seminary looking not to October but rather to November, namely the Christ the King Sunday, the last Sunday of the church year. Our reading that we're looking at is Luke 23 verses 27 to 43. Yes Future, you know the end of these apocalyptic events that are upon us that we in October 25th can only guess at, whether the Cubs have won the World Series or even if the unthinkable has happened and who knows who has won this presidential election. Uh, that said, this reading itself is relatively familiar. After all, you preach Good Friday, you've heard these texts before. For those of you keeping score at home, in fact, you'll find not one, not two, but three of the words of Christ from the cross. And one of the challenges that we have when we look at this text is to keep its liturgical context in mind. It would so be so easy to turn this into just another Good Friday sermon. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that, but we need to keep the day in focus. Namely, what does it mean to have Christ as a king? And I would encourage you as you approach this text to think of it in terms of, of, of the eschaton. Uh, yes, Christ's first parousia, his first advent is involved, but also keep this text in mind focusing more on its eschatological nature, on its Christ's second advent. The text itself, stouts are relatively familiar, and they were following him a great multitude of the people and of the women who were mourning and lamenting him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. And at this point, the text takes a bit of a turn. Jesus being led to be crucified, nothing super surprising there here in Luke chapter 23. But his object of address is surprising. He refers to the daughters of Jerusalem, which is frankly pretty stock language throughout the entire Old Testament for the people of Jerusalem. But by calling them the daughters of Jerusalem and telling them to not weep, he starts focusing in on the importance of his cross. He says, don't weep, but weep for yourselves. The contrast gets set up here in Luke chapter 23. The contrast is between Jesus' mission to the cross, his messianic destiny, compared to everything that's going on around him. He's told, he tells them to not weep because his cross has meaning. And this becomes contrasted with the destiny for Jerusalem. For the image of weeping is one that we know throughout Luke's gospel, especially during the crucifixion account. Peter, after all, weeps, same verb in play. He weeps over his failure when he denies Christ three times. And here the people are told to weep, the daughters of Jerusalem are weeping over the failure of Jerusalem to recognize her Messiah. And then it gets more, bigger. For behold, the days are coming when they say, Jesus says, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they'll begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green tree, what will happen in the dry? Jesus starts looking at the implications of his death and also the implications of the failure of the people. The image of children, of not bearing, this is a sign of divine unfavor. To wish to not have children, to long to not have children within this cultural context, is to wish that God turns away his benefits from the people. This image of this death wish and blessed are the barren and it piles on is a pretty poignant way in which the calamity of Jerusalem is going to be described. A calamity that, yes, discusses the events of 70 A.D., the destruction of Jerusalem, but also looks eschatologically. And remember, that's the focus we need to have here on the Christ the King Sunday, that this really is the foretaste of the final calamity at the end of the age. The calamities are scary. The imagery here is striking. But already way back in Luke 21, verse 28, 
we find out that the calamity itself is not completely bad. Rejoice and be glad, for you know your redemption is near. That after the destruction, after fiery judgment, God's final word does remain and always remains. That of redemption for the remnant, redemption ultimately brought forth in Christ's cross. Thus, in this first of three pictures that we're presented in, and one of the challenges, frankly, with this text is how do you preach all three, is that we have the image of doom and calamity that contrasts with Christ's purposeful death that results in the salvation of the world. But the text continues. And again, of course, we're in familiar enough ground here. Uh, Verses 32 to 38 of chapter 23. And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And the images go on and on. The mocking happens. Even the rulers were sneering at him. Verse Verse 35, he saved others, let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And now we again have another contrast. On one hand, we have the contrast between the purposeless death, 70 AD, the purposeless cataclysms, versus Christ's purposeful death, that's scene number one. And scene number two, we have Christ's forgiveness contrasted with the utter rejection by the leadership. And also it oozes with irony. If this is the Christ, his chosen one, mimics the languages of Satan way back in the temptation, and the hearer and the reader understand that while the Pharisees and the, ta- and the chief priests don't get it, the rulers, that Jesus ultimately is the chosen one. His death has meaning. And his death means he does not save himself, but rather he saves the entire world. Rejection versus acceptance. This is the interplay going on again here. Jesus accepts. Jesus forgives. People reject. Jesus responds. Father, forgive them. The leadership mocks and sneers. And then in verse 38, we run into that ironic description. It reads... This is the king of the Jews. Again, the irony here on Christ the King Sunday. Because this sign, this the, you are Jesus the king of the Jews, is designed to mock and humiliate. But on Christ the King Sunday, we discover that Christ is the king who wears a crown not of gold, but the crown of thorns. So we move to the third of these three images that cascade upon us on this Christ the King Sunday. We bump into the criminals, two responses again. One blasphemes him, and one accepts. One blasphemes, and the language there is pretty striking in the Greek. He's not just mocking him. He blasphemes Jesus. And that's significant because this shows more than just a, we don't like you. No, this is a rejection of the saving mission of Christ himself. This is the utter rejection. And now we bump into the final word of Jesus within this text. One thief gets it. and we always, I always love him being depicted in this image here. The one who mocks. The other one who says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The request itself is extremely significant. Jesus, remember me. And remembering here isn't head knowledge. That's not the sense. That's frankly not the biblical sense of remembering at all. To remember in the biblical sense means to take part in. It's a relational word. It's a participation word. It's not a making sure you can remember how to parse a Hebrew verb on one of my tests here at Concordia Theological Seminary. It's participation. 
and your kingdom. Now this takes us all the way back to the beginning. Jesus' mission, after all, and his ministry is simply stated, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is the dominant message of Jesus throughout the entire synoptic gospels. The kingdom of God in which Jesus breaks and hinders every evil salt of the devil. Every miracle points to the inbreaking and the reality of the kingdom of God with Christ on the scene. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me at the culmination of your kingdom. This, my friends, this is, if there ever was, the cry of faith. And now the words are familiar, but the punctuation is not. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today with me you will be in paradise. This word paradise is pregnant with possibilities. The word paradise, that's the Septuagint's rendering of Eden. The word paradise calls to mind the first creation, which also places us within eschatological time. Creation language is used to describe new creation. And in this word paradise, that's what the thief is asking Jesus, is what the Jesus is telling the thief he will see and will experience. Now the grammar is funny. Thankfully, Greek has no punctuation marks. Who would have thought commas would be so interesting? Then again, some of us love commas, love grammars, even if our students don't necessarily all the time. The issue here within the Greek is this issue of samaran. What does it modify? Truly, I say to you, does samaran modify Lego or met emu? I would argue that the typical English punctuation doesn't exactly get it all right. It's ambiguous of where it could be. But since Luke emphasizes Jesus' eschatological ministry, I would argue that the best way to understand this and to avoid a misuse, abuse, and oversimplification and overpreaching of heaven slash interim state is to move the comma not to, and he, said, and he said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be, but to have today actually modify say. In other words, Jesus is saying, in other words, it would read, truly I say to you today, comma, you will be with me in paradise. This keeps that eschatological hope present, which is congruent with much of Luke's theology as well. Three different segments, three different places to preach, three different options that engage us as hearers. I pray that God blesses you, people in the future, as we await the apocalypse with the Cubs and Indians playing tonight in the World Series here in October 25th of 2016. I pray that God blesses you as you preach this incredibly rich, familiar, and even better yet eschatological text on this final Sunday of the church year. Goodbye.